Uh, thank you so much for joining us on our Sunday afternoon of this world tour of a North American Taiwan Studies Association conference. Uh, my name is Richard Haddock. I'm the program manager at the East Asia National Resource Center here at the George Washington University. And I also uh, coordinate our Taiwan Studies Initiative, uh, which is part of the Cedar Center for Asian Studies. Uh, thanks so much to so many uh, familiar friends and faces and new ones that we've met along this conference. Uh, our panel today, we're joined by uh, a fantastic uh, panel of directors and scholars who are active in institution building. And this panel is constructed as such to really highlight uh, Taiwan studies, institution building challenges and prospects that we face uh, in universities and institutions of higher learning. I'd like to, of course, thank all of our sponsors to make this event possible, the Seeger Center for Asian Studies, the Taiwan Education and Research Program, the East Asia National Resource Center, and the North American Taiwan Studies Association. So uh, Taiwan Studies, and it, this conference has been centered around Taiwan Studies and application. The three main themes have been new direction in Taiwan Studies, marginalization in and of Taiwan Studies, and reflections on the binary between researchers and practitioners. Taiwan Studies institution building is something that merges all three of these together, as these are the institutions that can generate intellectual and human capital to, try, uh, to address uh, all of these major research and policy issues. They're also a wellspring for opportunities, networks, and connections uh, to foster uh, future communities of Taiwan Studies scholars and researchers. In recent years, greater attention has been given to U.S.-Taiwan relations in general, but also educational and cultural exchange. In December 2020, the U.S.-Taiwan Education Initiative was created between the United States and Taiwan uh, to expand access to Mandarin, Chinese, and English language instruction and to deepen educational cooperation between both sides. Uh, several Taiwan study centers in the United States have also received increased support to expand Taiwan studies. Uh, coinciding with this upsurge uh, in attention, uh, there's also international uh, news events and crises, such as uh, what's happening right now in Ukraine, uh, as well as Taiwan's international space and for such as the United Nations and public health related issues. At the same time, uh, widespread closure in the United States of Confucius Institutes and also other U.S.-China relations factors uh, are creating this uh, need for Mandarin language education in the United States, coupled with this uh, urgency for a greater understanding of Taiwan affairs, as well as language-capable uh, foreign service officers, diplomats, and scholars to continue to address these important international issues. So there's a mismatch between the level of importance in the United States regarding Taiwan and also its uh, educational resources available to uh, produce advanced studies on Taiwan affairs uh, and arts and humanities. Taiwan is currently the ninth largest trading partner of the United States and is consistently within the top 10. Uh, and yet there's fewer than uh, those many spaces uh, as Taiwan studies programs across the United States, formal brick and mortar centers that is. So this panel today will be addressing some of these issues as administrators and practitioners are coming together to talk about the challenges that we may collectively face and the optimism that we all share regarding building Taiwan studies programs in the United States. So before we get to our speakers, please allow me to introduce uh, our excellent panel. Uh, speaking first, we have Professor Vin Zhou, who's a professor of sociology and Asian American studies, the Walter and Shirley Wong Endowed Chair in US-China Relations and Communications, and director of the UCLA Asia Pacific Center. She is an internationally renowned scholar in the areas of migration and development, race and ethnicity, entrepreneurship, refugee studies, Asian diasporas, and the sociology of Asia and Asian America. Along with her from UCLA is Elizabeth Leicester, the executive director of the Asia Pacific Center. Uh, she has uh, done research and translations uh, about women and gender in Japan. Following her, we have uh, Professor Ellen Zhang, who's the Director of Arts and Culture at the Taiwan Studies Program at the University of Washington, and a PhD candidate in Cinema and Media Studies. 
As a simultaneous film scholar and art curator and practitioner, her research examines of the transactional encounter among contemporary Taiwanese video and art installations, cinema and popular culture as processes of aesthetic decolonization. And following her, we have Professor uh, Songsheng Ivan Zhang, who is a professor in the Department of Asian Studies and the Program and Comparative Literature at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also currently the director of their new Center for Taiwan Studies. Uh, Dr. Zhang was the president of the Association of Chinese and Comparative Literature in 1999 to 2000, and has served on a dozen editorial boards and held offices and scholarly organizations. Truly an excellent panel with uh, enormous institutional memory and, and history and legacy, as well as hopes for the future. So we'll start off with our online panelists first, and they'll present, and then we'll end with Ellen and then Yvonne. Uh, so, me and Elizabeth, the digital four is yours. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. And thank you again, Richard Haddock and uh, Sicker Center for Asian Studies of George Washington University, as well as the NATSA organizers for hosting this panel and inviting me and Elizabeth to speak on Taiwan studies at UCLA. Now, in our presentation, we will first say a few words about the Asia Pacific Center at UCLA in which our Taiwan studies program is housed. And then we'll give a brief discussion of our Taiwan studies program, including its history, institutional commitments, activities, as well as challenges and future directions. The UCLA Asia Pacific Center promotes greater knowledge and understanding of Asia and the Pacific region on campus and in the community through innovative research, teaching, public programs, and local and international collaborations. We focus on the inter-Asian and trans-Pacific cultural and social connections from historical, contemporary, and comparative perspectives and encourages interdisciplinary work on cross-border and supranational issues, such as language and culture, population and environment, technology, politics, social economic development, and the sustainability in the ongoing processes of globalization. The Asia Pacific Center is currently home to UCLA's Taiwan Studies Program, Program on Central Asia. We are also seeking to establish a Hong Kong Studies Program. Our center is also an academic partner of the Global Chinese Philanthropy Initiative. Now, the UCLA Taiwan Studies Program, we are proud to say, is one of the most active and vibrant centers of the, for the study of Taiwan in the United States. Situating Taiwan Studies in a global context, the program aims to promote a deeper understanding of Taiwan and Taiwan in the world. First, through research and teaching, we focus on Taiwan society and culture, including Asia-Pacific indigenous societies and Taiwan in the world, such as politics, international relations, straits relations, and global health. Secondly, uh, we do so through intellectual exchange and institutional collaborations. We build connections between UCLA and institutions and scholars in Taiwan in a variety of fields, including language training, education, public health, medicine, and engineering, and certainly through public outreach. Our Taiwan Studies program is faculty-led and governed by a Taiwan Studies Steering Committee, consists of uh, 13 faculty members, and it is built on UCLA strengths. Currently, UCLA has more than 30 faculty with expertise and background in Taiwan. Um, about 250 international students from Taiwan and numerous students of uh, Chinese, uh, Taiwanese, Taiwanese descent. 
And we also offer 35 courses on Taiwan, all with significant Taiwanese contents. The program has established partnerships with several campus units, including the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, Center for Chinese Studies, Center for Southeast Asian Studies, East Asian Library, School of Medicine Translational Oncology Training Programs, and the School of Education. We also draw on UCLA's strong relationship with Los Angeles Taiwanese American community, the largest in the U.S. Now, the program uh, serves as a hub for Taiwan-related academic programs and activities across campus while outreaching to the global Asian American and Taiwanese American communities. Our program has also steadily expanded to include institutional linkages, those are formal linkages with universities in Taiwan, such as Taiwan National, uh, National Taiwan University, National Taiwan Normal University, National Changchi University, Academia Sinica, and the Taiwan National Central Library. Now let me turn to Elizabeth Leister, our center's executive director, to give you further detail about our Taiwan Studies program. Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Min, and thank you to Richard and the organizers uh, for inviting us and including us in this exciting program. Um, I'll give a brief overview of the history of UCLA's Taiwan Studies program, some of the activities that we currently offer, and provide some comments on a few of the challenges that we've encountered in building and sustaining a Taiwan Studies program on our campus. The UCLA Taiwan Studies Program was initially conceived by a group of faculty with intellectual and professional ties to Taiwan. The Taiwan Studies Lectureship was established in 2014 with a grant from the Ministry of Education in partnership with TICO in Los Angeles, who have been great partners throughout uh, our program building. It received institutional campus support from the Dean of Humanities and the Vice Provost for International Studies and Global Engagement in the International Institute where our center is housed. The TSL, as we call it, was initially framed as focusing on the connections between contemporary Taiwan and the classical Chinese, Chinese tradition in which it is rooted and for which its academic institutions provide scholarly and archival resources. The grant has been renewed twice for a total of 11 years and counting, uh, and its scope has expanded to include the social and medical sciences with a broader focus on Taiwan in relation to emerging global issues such as transnational migration, indigenous identities, and comparative democratic societies. Starting in 2017, as Min mentioned, UCLA has established institutional partnerships with universities in Taiwan. And these partnerships have served to strengthen and streamline our academic networks and exchange programs through formal agreements and funding, as you can see here on the slide. In the fall of 2018, the uh, Asia Pacific Center received a gift of $2 million from the Jay Young and Family Foundation, which is based in Southern California. This endowment supports Taiwan studies and scholarships for undergraduate and graduate students from Taiwan high schools and universities. The endowment marked a turning point in our Taiwan studies program, ensuring that it will be sustained permanently. Then in 2021, uh, we were honored to receive another $2 million gift from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is the largest in the history of the ministry, uh, to establish a program on Taiwan in the world. That program promotes and disseminates Taiwan studies in a global context and aims to train the next generation of scholars and professionals to be well-versed in Taiwanese society, culture, and political economy, including proficiency in Mandarin Chinese and the reading and use of traditional characters. It also supports a postdoctoral fellowship, a lecture series, and a translation initiative. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs also provides funding for a new agreement with uh, our longtime partner, National Taiwan Normal University, which was signed in 2021 uh, as part of the new Mandarin Training and Exchange Initiative um, that uh, Richard referenced in the um, introduction. 
Now, uh, since 2014, the founding of our program, um, the APC Taiwan Studies Program has organized 10 academic conferences and over 50 public events, uh, including some that were held in the local Taiwanese community and presented in Mandarin. You can see a sample of some of our programming in this slide. Our academic programs and visiting scholar exchanges prioritize the advancement of scholarship and the strengthening of scholarly networks between Taiwan and UCLA. So for example, several edited volumes have been produced from our conferences. Our visiting scholars give guest lectures and co-teach in our courses and have also served uh, as an important pipeline and mentors for UCLA graduate students who are conducting research in Taiwan. Uh, and then the converse is also true for um, Taiwanese students who, who uh, do research with our faculty. Uh, and we also provide funding and other incentives for faculty to develop new courses or modules on Taiwan to expand the curriculum. Uh, we've also created a new Taiwanese language course that's been added to UCLA's Chinese language program. In the past eight years, we've given fellowships to 35 students for research in Taiwan or on, on Taiwan studies topics, and almost 60 J. Young scholarships for students from Taiwan. Uh, some of the challenges that we've encountered uh, in building and sustaining a Taiwan Studies program in campus uh, include some structural ones, uh, primarily the need for continual fundraising to support operations and programs. Um, there are also some legal and policy issues surrounding fundraising that we have to navigate in particular for Taiwan Studies. Uh, a couple of examples include um, Taiwan's tax laws that disincentivize overseas donations and so sort of limit our ability to um, do fundraising over there. Uh, and um, also various restrictions and reporting requirements um, by the US Department of Education, the state of California, uh, and the University of California on overseas government and private gifts. Some academic challenges uh, include balancing the wishes of funders with the research and instruction priorities of the campus. Um, since there's no degree program in Taiwan studies, uh, curricular development is contingent on working with individual faculty or, or instructional departments to expand course, course offerings. Um, and there's of course no guarantee that those courses will then continue um, long term. And finally, there's the evolving nature of research and scholarship on Taiwan and the question of how to sustain a program that will accommodate and adapt to the evolving field of Taiwan studies. Lastly, of course, the restrictions on travel precipitated by the pandemic have severely curtailed student and visiting scholar exchanges that are a core component of our program. While we do anticipate that travel will continue to open up, it's still unclear what the long-term impact on international study and exchange will be. Uh, thank you again. I look forward to the discussion. I will turn it over to Min for uh, final um, comments about our program's future directions. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And um, now uh, future directions, uh, very briefly. Um, the co our continual development of Taiwan studies depends largely on external funding. In future, we will continue our fundraising efforts to sustain and expand our program by outreaching to public funding agencies, foundations, and private donors for grants and gifts. There are a few most important items on our to-do and wish lists. We will continue to support curricular development that would include expanding contents within our existing courses, developing new courses, and establishing a minor or concentration or, uh, in Taiwan studies. We will continue to support faculty and student research and exchange. We will continue to maintain uh, strength and expand institutional collaborations with centers within UCLA's International Institute and across campus, as well as in Taiwan and elsewhere in the U.S. We wish to establish an endowed chair in that Taiwan Studies and eventually a center for Taiwan Studies at UCLA. Uh, thank you. And we are eager 
to work with any of you in the audience who are interested uh, in collaborating with us on Taiwan studies. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much for uh, a great presentation and congratulations on not only securing funding, but also uh, using that to generate very great programming and uh, curriculum development there. Uh, so next, I'd like to invite Ellen to give a presentation on what's going on at University of Washington. Um, thank you first um, to me and Elizabeth for this all encompassing and over, like, very fantastic and fascinating overview of the Thomas Studies program at UCLA. And so uh, good afternoon again, and thank you, um, NASA and all the co-sponsors for organizing this wonderful event. And thank you, Richard, for inviting me to this plenary discussion and for this very kind introduction, which uh, definitely reminded me to work on my dissertation so that I can really start on my feet to get my professorship before you actually call me professor. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, I will use, um, okay, microphone is not my best, so I will try to navigate my voice. Okay, so I will use my time to go over um, some very recent development of our own program from the perspective of specifically arts and culture programming, and it's linked to the more conventional kind of academic setting, the Town Studies program in the U.S. usually embodied to hopefully offer some perspectives on where Town Studies is today and perhaps how to grow talent cities in the future. So let me first borrow the associate chair of our talent cities program, James Lynn's note at the closing plenary at the fourth World Congress of Talent Cities just a week ago and start with a narrative that you are all familiar with. In the past five years, we're see, we've seen a resurgence of talent cities in North America Similar to the University of You Work and Do Research at the University of Washington has also been a beneficiary of this trend. And like other talent studies initiatives, programs, and centers, we have offered new coursework, a slate of public events and programs, and recently a new book series with the University of Washington Press. Since its establishment in 2017, the UW Talent Studies program with its primarily academic presence has been dedicated to research education and outreach on talent society and culture. Um, toward, the end of the two, uh, toward the end of 2021, the academic program was joined by a twin sibling. With a MOFA grant, the Talent Arts and Culture program was funded to curate and showcase talent's arts and culture by linking talent artists and cur um, cultural organizations to our American cultural institutions, as well as amplifying and propagating exhibits, performances, and events through in-person and online programming. The Taiwan the Talent Studies program as a whole served as a global um, center of knowledge in artistic and cultural exchange for students, scholars, artists, and the public. So almost all of the administrator and faculty members involved in organizing and operating Taiwan Studies across different universities um, wear so many different hats. And the same applies to UW, uh, UW as well. As part of my um, curatorial and programming roles, I offer one talent-centric undergraduate course every year, which plays a part of not only knowledge dissemination and production, but equally importantly, to continue to foster a talent studies community. Besides that, I'm also a PhD candidate working on my dissertation on contemporary talent movie images. I joined the University of Washington on a doc um, as a doctoral student a few months before our talent studies program was officially up and running. So the opportunities, um, the graduate cohort and I were given to partake, to observe, and also to participate in the program's growth from the very beginning tells a lot about this program and how it defines itself. So from its founding, the program provides an engaged um, interdisciplinary community for UW undergraduate and graduate students across all the academic um, events hosted by the program, from public events to academic activities, the student cohort has always been an integral part in the planning and execution of the event. And more significantly, they also play a vital role of um, producing and disseminating understandings of talent society with their, over, with their own research. Each and every one of them um, connect academic research and scholarships with the local communities in their own unique ways, which all goes into the initial proposal and now the shaping of the arts and culture program at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. 
So Seattle is the home city for our program uh, present a very unique context. On the one hand, it's attention to local cultures and communities and its, con um, its concerns for marginalized voices um, in connection to land rights and environmental issues speaks closely to the heart of the arts and culture program that we're building. On the other hand, being a tech city, it shares many overlapping lifestyles and concerns with Taiwan, specifically the tensions between promoting the city as a uh, tech hub versus taking special care of um, local culture and small communities. These two characteristics um, together are at once very exciting, but also challenging for the introduction and promotion of Taiwan arts and culture. In this unique context, our program faces a unique audience when we try to reach beyond the academic walls um, and the university communities, which urges us to create, um, to be very creative and trying to cater our content specifically for Seattle. Oops, sorry. So for this reason, the arts and culture program um, it's envisioned to pioneer new modes of operation. Or um, ordinarily, we initiate events by inviting speakers, managing a venue, to invite advertisements, and playing and paying expenses and per diem, all aimed primarily at a campus audience who would usually seize every opportunity to be um, exposed to every possible moments of learning and um, research. However, moving our program beyond the academic world calls for new projects for our new and very picky audience. Um, to be able to compete with everything else out there um, and to attract those with an appetite. As our program chair, Bill Lafley, would put, for all of those cultural expression in Taiwan, there exists in, in North America an audience. The trick is to link them up. So with that in mind, we decided early on to go with time-based program, technology, indigeneity, environment, queer identity, migration and diaspora are some of the things that we have explored and believe to have the capacity for not only bringing the uniqueness of Taiwan's arts and culture, but also connecting to what the Seattleites are looking for. The goal is to give the existing arts and culture audience in Seattle and the broader Pacific Northwest a reason to explore our program and to put Taiwan onto their radar. So while the ultimate goal is to promote Taiwan and its arts and culture, this, in a very broad sense, um, site-specific curatorial approach differs from the conventional cultural politics when it comes to um, exporting cultural content. Recontextualizing and reframing the town-centric content in a program plays a key role in the process. In this way, instead of trying to build a brand new audience out of scratch or serving exclusively um, the overseas Taiwanese community, we get to bring our content to the existing local programs and organizations out there who will enlist their own audience and at the same time welcome new audience members. On this front, our public programming benefits a lot from UW as a public university with a strong emphasis on open and public facing scholarship, especially in the humanities. We work with our faculty member and graduate students and take inspiration from the research focuses and explore potential arts and cultural programming that connects research and classrooms with public events and the public. Um, take the recent World Congress of Taiwan Studies as an example again. Not only did the operation of the Congress depend significantly on our graduate student, so did our extended programming that went beyond the panel schedule. We draw from the panel themes and connected them to the local cultural resources. We greeted our Congress participants with those nostalgic and very trendy grandma shopping bags, which is out of the frame right now, um, and locally made Taiwanese gray sport and three cup chicken bento boxes, um, which we are so thrilled to learn that um, one of the Congress participants and also one of the NASA board members, um, Ericton, who is, I believe is here, um, actually managed to follow up with an interview with the owner of the restaurant as part of his field work. So following the Congress, two events were um, organized again, both based on the panel themes and the connections between Taiwan and Seattle. One of which was a museum walk and meetup at the Burke Museum of National History and Culture, which featured an authentic um, Taiwanese indigenous Chapala um, Pimbanjo um, as the centerpiece in its Culture is Living Gallery. Later in the night, we invited the Congress participants to join the local LGBT uh, community to celebrate the last bit of Seattle Pride Month with a special collaborative screening and director Q&A of Tom co-production Money Boys with the Seattle International Film Festival. These were all part of the collaborative programming that drew inspiration from our academic events and made possible by our graduate students' cohort. 
So as a program born in the middle of the pandemic, um, the first friend we made was COVID-19 and an anxious but very virtual oriented audience. Ironically, working around COVID-19 is as challenging as it is inspiring. Um, we are definitely pushed to think out of the box with the online platform. With that, we were also given an opportunity to explore and pursue content diversity by participating directly with um, cultural producers and with organizations both local and in Taiwan, we were able to make more direct connections, albeit still virtually, um, to the cultural content in Taiwan. For example, earlier this year, um, in memory of the 228 incident, we live broadcasted Gongsheng Music Festival and offered it on demand throughout March. Being able to screen not only films, but also performances um, was a blessing for a programmer especially when we're thinking about and talking about financial costs. It's much cheaper to do that instead of in person. However, um, when, what remains challenging um, is to bring back the audience in real life and also the in-person experience. Luckily, the artists and the cultural producers we have worked with are all very open to exploring all kinds of formats to try to recreate in-person experiences. For example, we were very lucky to uh, premier small island based songs US tour with Town Hall Seattle um, through their existing global rhythm program. We offer the performance through hybrid formats, allowing the artists and audience to make both in person and virtual connections. Um, we also posted screenings, interviews, and interactive workshops with the artists to make the experience more participatory and engaging. So, what we have learned from our eight months of arts and culture programming is that none of our program and the linkage we, are, we have been trying to make can happen without collaboration and partnerships. We, we rely on collaboration to, uh, for content creation, and we also rely on partnerships to, pr uh, to productively reach um, our desired audience, to further cultivate our own audience and foster our own community for future programming and for the cross-cultural exchanges our program is trying to form. Collaboration allows us to share resources and benefits from cross, crossing different borders, crossing different forms, and connecting different ideas and human capitals. We still wear many different hats, but now we get to wear them with a lot of people with like-minded um, pursuits and sometimes with swap accessories. So um, these, again, all come back to building a mutual relationship. Um, within and beyond our campus communities. With that in mind, we're always in the process, in the process of exploring new trends and new trends to promote Taiwan's arts and culture. One of the curatorial mode that we're moving toward is to break the dichotomy between cultural producer and receivers through collaborative curation in the modes of open calls and social media takeover. So this is something um, we can probably talk about later in the discussion if there's interest. Um, on a related note, um, I'm going to end my presentation with a shameless self-promotion. So we would love to connect with you all. Ideas for collaboration, things you want to see. Let's make it happen together. So thank you, and I look forward to the discussion that follows. Thanks so much, Ellen, for a great presentation. And I'm really taking away the localization of uh, Taiwan Studies Institution Building uh, and what uh, works or resonates with uh, Seattleites has uh, formed the programming there. We can talk more about that localization of uh, institution building further in our Q&A. Uh, so next up, Professor John, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard, for bringing me over here and after listening to these uh, wonderful presentations, I just kind of, you know, realize even more how different each program is, right? And I listened to the uh, fourth Congress of Taiwan, World Congress of Taiwan Studies last week, and then also realized, I mean, at that time, that three different presentations have, we have very different models. And uh, I think that's probably good because, uh, you know, a lot of you will eventually uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, probably fall into one of those situations. And, uh, you know, the major difference between uh, the Taiwan Study Program and later, you know, a very new uh, Center with Taiwan Studies 
uh, from the other, uh, from UCLA and UW, is that we have never done fundraising. We have never reached out to the community. So it's pretty much a one woman show for the last, <laughs> uh, for the last uh, you know, uh, 12 or 13 years. And the other thing is the difference between us and others is like, uh, you know, when Richard mentioned, there was a surge of interest, right, in Taiwan. And we started before that surge, right? Actually, we started during, in the middle of the China fever. Right? So it was kind of very, very different. Uh, on top of that, uh, University of Texas at Austin kind of uh, uh, realized a um, long time ago, like 30, 40 years ago, that because the East Coast and West Coast and the Middle East, Middle West uh, universities are kind of already developed, uh, you know, East Asian programs, China programs, Japan programs. So we better kind of build our own niche. So which is, which is um, South Asian studies. So uh, East Asian study at UT is really uh, being colonized <laughs> or uh, a foster child and so on and so forth. So it's kind of a, within that kind of circumstances, uh, we found our niche. So let me uh, kind of a, uh, talk about just kind of briefly uh, the, uh, what we have done and then I look forward for questions uh, uh, for uh, about our um, challenges and the limitations. Let me, let me see what that with you. As you can see, we uh, started our Taiwan Studies program because of the uh, offer. We, are, we were invited to apply for a grant from the uh, uh, MOE, Ministry of uh, Education. And then uh, last year, apparently we've done um, relatively well. So we were invited again. So that's why we never done uh, fundraising. We kind of the money just fell on our lap, and then uh, <laughs> so last year we started the Center for Taiwan Studies. But I, when I try to compare our center to the uh, UCLA ones, I think there's no comparison. <laughs> okay, so this is when the uh, James Ling from uh, UW was asking me to kind of write a few notes. Uh, about our program, and this is uh, it. You know, interestingly, so the first thing you have already heard from me, uh, you know, after uh, 12 years, we were kind of recognized enough to kind of ask to build a more comprehensive center. Um, but the, uh, the second line is interesting because I changed this from, you know, this is taking advantage of our existing strength, but originally it was uh, based on our weaknesses, right? <laughs> uh, very uh, particular weaknesses, one of them being that Texas is located in such a kind of a, you know, position, you know, we used to joke <laughs> that it takes one day to drive out of Texas. <laughs> so they're, they're not you know, kind of a similar large university close by that we can collaborate and uh, directors, writers, and celebrities don't just stop by, you know, because they pass by London or the field thing of LA. About that. So we try to kind of focus um, on the academic side because we do have quite a few uh, faculty. We just happen to have a few faculty who are interested in um, you know, research and teaching about that. All right, so the third thing is what we are most proud of. Uh, I've seen that uh, UCLA has also kind of offered a large number of Taiwan courses, 35 courses on Taiwan, but even, uh, you know, five years, uh, four years ago, um, when the NASA was held at our campus, UT Austin, we were already kind of a you know, very proud to say that we offer um, about 40 courses already kind of between uh, 2009 and 2018. Um, so this is the one thing that I, I think we are very proud of. And then I think this is also creating kind of a long-term impact on those students who have taken those courses. Because, you know, added together, we have already kind of, a, you know, close to 1,000 students who have taken, you know, very substantial, uh, well-designed courses on Taiwan. 
All right. The other thing is that um, we have, you know, this is because that's really kind of our existing strength in a sense that we um, are quite different from other universities, you know, even since, um, even, you know, in the, um, the uh, one of our colleagues, uh, the late uh, Professor Jeanette Lolo, organized the first um, large um, conference and symposium on Taiwan literature um, in the middle of Cold War. Right? So in uh, 1979, and that became kind of put us on the map. And it was also because of that I kind of joined the faculty. After I joined the faculty, we have other faculty members who just, uh, you know, happen to be interested in publishing and then uh, doing research. So this is a, you know, a kind of different from other uh, the university centers. We, we, you know, we started with a uh, faculty's own interest in Taiwan, but specifically in terms of research. I think this might be relevant to a lot of you because I mean, very few people kind of have their primary goal to become an administrator of uh, the director of the center of uh, you know whatever kind, but uh, you know most of you are uh, going to be um, you know faculty um, teaching and researching in Taiwan. I think you know this is something you could also do on the side, uh, but. Uh, you know, both, ben, uh, both benefit your own career and also the general field of Taiwan studies. Okay, that's why I did, I had my, you know, um, uh, as I uh, mentioned here, they, are, they have been like 13 PhD students just kind of specializing in Taiwan's literature or cultural or film, um, you know, in the last 15 years or so, and also my own pet project which is uh, Taiwan Lit. I have some flyers here. I also put it, uh, you know, um, put on, I'll put some uh, with the front desk uh, yesterday. So anybody who are, you know, I know there are very few of you who specialize in literature, but, but you know, please uh, spread the word. And because uh, with a new center, we are also trying to, uh, you know, develop another e-journal, uh, and, you know, focusing on politics, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan focus, uh, you know, political science, uh, kind of uh, um, publications. All right, let me kind of quickly move on to things that we have done. Okay, we have already uh, mentioned, but uh, the one of the things uh, I've been asked by many people saying. Uh, that um, not asked, but that I heard comments from other people saying that we wish in the future we can have a Taiwan studies track or Taiwan studies major or minor, right? We kind of chosen to do huevo, right? We were trying, we, uh, you know, the second year we received this grant from MOE and, you know, didn't even have any other kind of uh, institutional support. I just started to ask my department whether we can have a time and stay major, right? But it turned out, you know, we went through, I wanted to show one of the, um, yeah, this is, I copied this from my annual report um, uh, for um, 2010. This is what I, we did. We had to go through all the kind of a, from the, um, the college, the chancellor of the UT system, and so on and so forth. And I, uh, till now, I still don't understand why we got re-approved uh, because we then uh, had uh, a, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan studies track under the Taiwan study major and parallel to our uh, special, uh, you know, realization is East Asian study and South Asian study. So Taiwan study is kind of our, our side by side with East Asian study and South Asian study. But that was just the beginning of the good news. And later on, we realized it didn't really work well, you know, because, uh, you know, the reason we could do it is because UT, for some reason, allowed or encouraged uh, double major or triple major. Therefore, the students who special uh, who major in you know computer science or accounting 
and a lot of Asian students uh, specialize, uh, you know, major in, in those, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, subjects could uh, do a double major, triple major on Taiwan study. Because imagine if you want just to have Taiwan studies as a major, you know, you can <laughs> imagine probably you only have a very few people uh, wanting to uh, take your major, right? Because of the job market and everything. But even with this double major and triple major, I think you, because we require, uh, you know, taking some courses, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it didn't work. So I, I stopped kind of even bothering to check how many major we have. <laughs> so this is a, even though I think the, uh, this is something that we probably want to, to kind of think about, you know, for other people who have, who are developing kind of studies or centers or, or programs, because, you know, that was also when uh, it kind of dawned on me, you really want to look long-term. You know, that's why I kind of go back to kind of focus on more on training the next generation of uh, scholars, of teachers, right? And then kind of starting uh, a, journal uh, on Taiwan literature is part of the, um, you know, building the groundwork. I, I think with diff different disciplines, I mean, now we really are uh, kind of I have a more favorable kind of a circumstances. And then I think it's time for us to think longer. Okay. Uh, because uh, you want people to be uh, able to uh, kind of find a job, right? And also, uh, kind of a uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, intellectually uh, thinking that uh, if I uh, get a you know talent studies major, uh, it would be uh, something uh, rewarding enough you know, to undertake for for undergraduate. So uh, let me see. Go back. Okay. Yeah, I have covered that. And self-assessment, I think this, number one, I've already talked about it. Uh, number two, course offerings. I think we, were, we also started at a time when a lot of PRC scholars are very much interested in teaching Taiwan subjects. And they were, I mean, it's, it's too bad. Everybody knows, like in recent years, there's a much greater hostility, right, between the two sides. But during that period of time, you know, scholars who grew up in China uh, in the 1980s when they went to college, they really admired Taiwanese culture. Right? I have a student right now writing on the impact of Taiwan, you know, film and uh, popular music on, on China, right? So, so, you know, time has changed. You know, we, we of course, we have to uh, come up with different strategies. But uh, some of our best horses, uh, offered by PRC scholars, they would talk about something like democratization in East Asia, China, Taiwan compared. We like that, right? And then there are some other courses like state building or uh, uh, film, you know, uh, 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 art films, like, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, Indian scholars who, uh, film scholars who offered a course on, on Edward Young, uh, Tai Ming Liao, and Jia Zhang Ke. And the Tico asked me, who's Jack and Jia Zhang Ke? But the, the thing is that, you know, this uh, scholar really emphasized on the, uh, you know, the influence of, uh, you know, some of the uh, Taiwanese cinema uh, directors on East Asian, you know, uh, uh, filmmakers, including uh, Jia Zhang Ke, some of the uh, film directors. All right, okay. The, Okay, graduate student training, as I said, this is something I think really depending on whether you have some faculty who, whose own research, uh, you know, long-term career objective is falling into this area. And my dream is to see our next generation scholars would be doing that in, you know, in your uh, own uh, uh, you know, uh, faculty position. Uh, we used to do a lot of activities like film festival. We invite a lot of, because of my own interests. We invite you know, a lot of uh, uh, well-known uh, writers, uh, scholars, 
然后白先勇、黄春明，然后呃朱天文、刘克襄 ，and so on so forth. But I just realized in recent years, people uh our students, undergraduate students, are not going attending activities as much as they did before. I think had a lot to do with the digital uh, revolution. You know, therefore we kind of switched. That's also part of the reason I kind of I moved and kind of shifted our energy to developing、um, e journals and、uh, some other more research research focused activities. All right, so I've already covered that. You know, I、uh, I mean I want to、uh, mention the final point: institutional structure. You know, I already already mentioned the double triple major allows us to,、uh, you know, develop a Taiwan study major. And when I attended a conference at the uh, SOAS uh, London, um, when I mentioned that、uh, we have offered so many courses on Taiwan, our European colleagues couldn't believe it because they think they said it takes forever to propose a course. No one's、uh, the course get approved. You're going to teach it for all your life. <laughs> so this is not something、uh, that、uh, they could do. But then I, I'm sure a lot of you, if you get into a large、uh, public university, this is something you could、uh, you could ask your colleagues to do to、uh, kind of teach a、uh, Taiwan、um, related courses. And one of the things I Focus on is that I had talked to Tico, saying that、uh, are we going to censor our contents? I mean, whatever, what、uh, kind of a, a subject matter、uh, taught in the courses? They said no, that's great. But then I also want to make sure that a teacher doesn't just kind of say that I include like one third of that one, but you know, after several times they would reduce it to. Uh, something like a couple of films, so I insist on that the on the、uh, course title you have to have Taiwan. You can have China, Taiwan, Japan, or whatever. But then you know that's one of the strategies、uh, to kind of make sure that、uh, the visibility of Taiwan is uh, kind of uh, uh, you know sufficient to、uh, to make sure that the、uh, you know.、Uh, Achieve our impact. Okay, I know I'm myself, and then I'm happy to answer questions about, especially the challenges. <laughs> Thanks so much for the presentation.、Uh, one thing that stood out to me is、uh, the emphasis on long-term prospects and how to、uh, build out Taiwan studies with that long-term vision. Uh, so, discussing more about Taiwan Lit and publication, how that's part of the equation of Taiwan Studies institution building, we can explore that further. So, for our in-person panelists, please join us at the front, and we'll be now going into a Q and A session.、Uh, so, our online audiences, if you haven't already, please feel free to type in questions in the Q and A,、uh, and we'll be tracking those. I'll start us off with a few questions here. So、uh, one question for all of our panelists、uh, that I want to dig into is kind of a common theme that I've、uh, seen throughout all our presentations, which is the localization of Taiwan Studies institutions.、Uh, just a little bit about our own Taiwan Studies program here at GW. It's a concoction of uh, three uh, different institutions、uh, and many other、uh, supporting departments, but. In, 2004, we created our、uh, Taiwan Education and Research Program, and collaborate closely with the GW Library for、uh, Taiwan Studies-related databases.、Uh, we hold a large collection of the Taiwan magazines,、uh, for example.、Uh, that's very important for、uh, Taiwan's democratization movement.、Uh, but we also,、uh, with the Secret Center for Asian Studies,、uh, host and have hosted for quite a while public forum like today. Uh, that explores different policy issues,、uh, and we、uh, now recently have the Taiwan Studies Initiative to、uh, try to intentionally build up our academic programming with new classes, fellowships,、uh, scholarships,、uh, and conference support.、Uh, so our localized needs here in GW, being at the intersection of、uh, policy and research, has really been that that policy driven、uh, discourse on. Taiwan in U.S.-Taiwan relations, U.S. foreign policy, international affairs in general, 
And so a lot of our course offerings uh, that we may offer have some kind of a policy discussion element. Uh, so uh, I'd like to hear from all of our panelists, perhaps starting with me and Elizabeth online, and then uh, going to Alan and Yvonne afterwards. But if you could comment a bit about the uh, localization of your Taiwan Studies institutions, what have you found to be some of these community needs uh, or demands uh, from students uh, in your areas? And how has that influenced uh, the way that your Taiwan Studies programs have developed? Thank you. Um, thank you, Richard. I'll go first. Um, so localization can mean a lot of different things, right? So um, what I would think, like, first, I wouldn't use localization, but I would think that it's very important for a program to sustain itself and expand is to, um, you know, one is funding. And funding requires a lot of outreaching and also requires a lot of uh, uh, um, uh you know, institutional support. And outreaching is, to me, it's localization. You know, it's take our program to the local community, especially the local Asian American and Taiwanese American community for support, um, both in terms of, you know, funding support as well as participation support. And the other one is very important, uh, you know, for you, Richard, to me in localization, to reach out to students and faculty on campus because campus is wide and large and it's very multidisciplinary. So it's important for us to have program that reach out to, um, to a wider audience across uh, campus rather than just focus on the humanities and social sciences. Um, as you said, you know, your pro program is very policy driven. We have that, um, uh, that as well. And then also uh, it's important to really mo mobilize the interests of faculty and students because they are, the kind of the flesh and blood of uh, the, the program, as well as outreach to the community. Uh, Elizabeth, did you want to add? Um, yeah, I, I guess I would um, just um, echo uh, what Min said um, about the the broad disciplinarity uh, and interest across uh, campus. Um, and um, it, the, I would, it, when I was presenting um, the evolution of our program um, that started um, with, you know, sort of Taiwanese culture as rooted in classical Chinese tradition, um, you know, it was, it, it, when we started, there were, there were certainly faculty on campus who um, do research in, in Taiwan studies and, and Taiwanese topics. Um, but it really, you know, we really had to, um, um, you know, sort of build it up as a niche sort of from within Chinese studies, you know, and we have a we have a very very strong Chinese studies program uh, on campus, and we have a Chinese studies center that's um, very you know sort of has a long history and is very distinguished and a lot of uh, affiliates. Um, and so part of our strategy has been, um, you know, to be as inclusive as possible. I mean, I was very interested in, in the way that um, Evelyn was describing, um, you know, the the um, um, framing of faculty interests and support of, uh, for research um, uh, uh, at UT, um, you know, br bringing in people who, um, you know, specialize in Chinese studies, but have a particular interest in Taiwan or, or academic connections with Taiwan. Um, but then also expanding to um, faculty who don't consider themselves area studies specialists or even East Asian studies specialists. And um, so a couple of um, programs um, 
and new courses that faculty uh, have developed are um, that are kind of signature programs now. One, one is by uh, an archaeologist, anthropologist on our campus who specializes in Philippine um, archaeology and has established a relationship with um, uh, a scholar at um, National Chungji University um, and has um, you know, basically, you know, built up this this very comprehensive, um, innovative new program on um, engaged archaeology of the um, Asia Pacific region, um, and Taiwan is a is a kind of key component of that. They've developed a field school where they bring UCLA students to Taiwan, and so his background is not in. Taiwan studies, but, um, you know, because we were, you know, sort of broad, you know, broad and inclusive and sort of open to just, you know, well, you know, consider building a Taiwanese module into an existing course that may not be about China or Taiwan. Um, we, I think we've, we've um, expanded that profile on campus. And, um, and I, I think in the long term, kind of makes, you know, sort of elevates Taiwan studies long term to a more, um, you know, sustainable um, focus. So I will respond from, again, specifically uh, from the perspective of arts and culture program. So as I mentioned, um, when, when we put our program out to the public, instead of focusing on campus communities, who basically will come to every Taiwan related events, no matter what we give. Um, but when you put it out to the public, they are very picky, they're very selective because they have so many things to choose from. They don't necessarily have to come to a Thai event that they can go to watch a Hollywood movie or something else. So especially when we combine public events with fundraising or taking selfies, it becomes very obvious and becomes very harsh. You have to learn this in a hard way because if your content is not something the Seattleite or the local communities are looking for what they wanted to see, they basically just don't show up, your ticket won't sell. So that's one of the factor or one of the harsh truths of doing public programs, especially when it's arts and culture related instead of like very academic focused kind of um, uh, formats. And um, I think another way to think about this is in terms of classroom design and also syllabus design. So offering courses in graduate level is different from offering courses in undergraduate level. And so graduate students know what they're there for. They, they take the things they want to do their research and to benefit their own um, research and everything and writing. But then when undergraduate students come here, they come here for, they don't really know exactly what they want, but they want to know what you want to give them. Uh, but they will bring in their background, they will bring, bring in their... Um, their focus, their uh, major, their cultural background, everything. And then what we do with our program is that we make the syllabus very open. So we do offer um, themes on the syllabus, but at the same time, we allow the students bring, to bring in their background. So we have students from computer science. We have students from business or things that UW are very famous for. But they all come together to learn something about Taiwan. So we, um, we, we manage to come up with a format that allows to, students to input to, to contribute to how the syllabus is built. So how can we combine things about Taiwan to the major or the things they care about in computer science majors or the things they care about when they're doing gender um, um, studies or the things they care about when they're doing man business management or statistics, things like that. Like how do we combine things like that? So it's more about instead of really trying to cater or re really trying to reframe or just change the way Taiwan content, Taiwan related contents are presented or offered is that we're trying to, as I said, collaborate or um, just work together so that we get the things we want out there and we also at the same time know and understand what people are expecting. Yeah. What is the question? <laughs> if you could uh, comment a bit about the uh, localization of uh, the talent studies uh, programming, uh, community needs, or it could be campus needs, but anything that you've seen has shaped uh, the, the look of your talent studies program. I think we, as I said, we would seriously and the staff that therefore we're just kind of focusing on the campus. The, uh, as I said, the, um, um, 
uh, uh, we the courses were the the courses we offered were uh, you know in uh, by instructors from uh, three different colleges and uh, you know, six different departments. At the beginning, we did have a lot of kind of heritage students. I mean, Chinese or Southeast Asian, you know, heritage students. But gradually, you know, depending on the topic, the the subject, you know, we we really like that the fact that we have a more uh, mixed uh, student body. And yeah, so the uh, other thing I didn't uh, get to mention is once we have. Even though we just have a very kind of limited uh, program, even though we're starting to have a center, but we're still uh, very limited. I do. Uh, I was able to get uh, Professor Alin Zeng in Great Point as uh, as a science uh, department to be the social director. So she is kind of moving uh, on the other direction to strengthen the uh, social sciences. Um, but uh, but still, we have very limited uh, uh, people. But then I I think the uh, the fact that uh, you you uh, is a very large university have eighty uh, you know fifty thousand students, therefore you always get some kind of other people who get a, a CCK funding to one single event or the um, you know uh, the National Taiwan uh, the Central Library. Had uh, a something like Chinese Resource Center, whatever. So we have a lot of uh, other things going on. Yeah. So it's built. basically, the, all those things contribute to the uh, building of the visibility at, at the university. And, and then you know, I totally agree. Funding really, really helps. Not <laughs> that we have more. You know, you know, the new center receives support from the. Um, from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and therefore we are able to, we also have a yoga at the BAF program so that in collaboration with Taida. And um, we, we are now able to offer them some travel, travel subsidy. We are now finally able to support the first year, uh, you know, PhD students who can offer them so they don't have to just start, uh, you know, from uh, serving as Chinese language PAs and all that. So it's just that I think the, uh, I'm pretty sure all, you know, um, the colleges, universities that um, you are going to uh, enter, uh, uh, you know, it's for your career, uh, may not have uh, such a good, uh, you know, uh, resources or institutional support like the ones we, we heard, right? You know, so you have to kind of start off very well. Uh, strategically. <laughs> Great, thanks so much. So if we, we can uh, have questions from the audience, feel free to uh, raise your hand if anyone has a question. Yes, right here. Hi, um, my name is Carl Brunberg. I'm from the Taiwan Studies Program at the University of Alberta in Canada. Um, so I guess my question is, um, just as it relates to holding events to try and get interest in Taiwan studies, whatever that might look like, or just Taiwan culture and stuff, um, I was wondering if anyone, if, as for all participants, so feel free to jump in however, but um, if you could speak to the timing of these things insofar as during the year, because we found that at the beginning of September, especially for students, they're maybe willing to go to some things, but we find very quickly the closer you get to exams, it's almost impossible to get people out to anything. And then even the winter semester is often even less interest. Maybe students, we think students are getting more burnt out, at least I am. Um, so I was just wondering um, if you could maybe speak to what kind of events, how the, the time of the year might change, what types of events you hold. Um, I mean, we found that free food is almost always a good thing for students. But, um, you know, we I think we found that earlier in the year, um, more intense, longer events are, are appropriate, but as we get later in the year, keeping things quick um, and, and handing out as many free things as possible is the only way to ensure people show up, because I think people just get so busy with exams or just, at least in Canada where I am, it gets really cold, so it's also hard to just get people out of their homes. 
um, when they don't have to be. Um, so yeah, so I was just wondering for all participants, um, anything, um, just how the timing of the year or the semester um, affects what events you hold and um, where you found success, where you found struggles. <laughs> May I say something first? Please go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, I think I think it's a, a challenge to um, to keep students' interest high uh, over the you know the course of a semester or a quarter. So for our um, activity scheduling, we normally don't schedule activities in the first week and the and then the last week, and then we are very sensitive to the midterm exam period that we try not to schedule um, activities or public talks. But then one of the things we could, um, we could get students interested is, you know, through um, uh, reaching out to instructors and then, uh, you, know, at, uh, you know, you know, as instructors to um, advertise the events to students and perhaps give extra credit. And extra credit is very effective because students actually come uh, for extra credit. And then through, you know, this, then they learn and then they get their interest at uh, high. Uh, so that's very effective. But, um, you know, it's always a challenge when students are doing a lot of other things. And then right now, you know, COVID gives us an opportunity. That is, we organize a lot of things online, and then we also record the stuff, and then um, we uh, continuously outreach to instructors about, you know, what we have, and then the instructors could build in their syllabus about, you know, those online events that have been recorded for students to um, to pay attention to. So, so that. That would be a, uh, I think, for us, it's um, it's quite uh, effective. Well, I guess it's very similar to Portal compared to Seattle because we also have a lot of rains, so we don't really have a big time frame to host events, and it's hard to get people up there when it's so gray and wet. So um, we do focus a lot of events in um, fall. So we are on a quarter system. So everything in September, October, um, November is the, the prime month for us to host public events. But again, for our um, the goal of our arts and culture program is not only to focus on campus like students or um, faculty members, but to um, to reach like the broader audience and um, like the local communities and a lot of things. But I do agree. Combining the events to um, syllabus and um, to, um, to classroom settings are really effective. And oftentimes, um, so what, from what I experienced when I'm teaching in arts and culture um, undergraduate course is that when, I, when a student gets together and knows about each other's interests and things like that, they, they do things together too. And that oftentimes encourages them to, to attend events together. So just like how sometimes they miss individual papers, but they often don't miss group presentation because they feel the pressure and they want to do things together. They want to have friendship and a lot of things. And so encourage friendship and encouraging connections and encouraging networks is something that have been very helpful in terms of um, hosting events um, that is outside of like, homework or assignments or um, classroom kind of assignments. Um, and we, uh, so I guess we already managed to know that food um, extra credits worth for student. Um, free tickets work very well too. So for public events, we oftentimes have to um, work with or collaborate with uh, local organizations who would charge tickets um, sales to go to performances or go to concerts or go to film screenings. But um, as a co-sponsor, we usually ask a lot of like con tickets and that's the time when we give to students and um, campus members, um, university members. So that, that's often the, also the time um, when a student would have like a better attendance and you don't really just get tickets as a very easy thing you make it a giveaway you make it very special very precious things and i also encourage students to attend so yeah oh and sorry um so our program is also um trying to come up with some fancy swag so that people will come to get maybe 
like a pop, uh, what is that thing on the phone, the post, um, yeah, um, and also like cell phone things or pins and things like that. So those are the three stuff that would also attract audience. Uh, we have one question right here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you all for your uh, presentation. Uh, I'm a visiting scholar here. Yeah. I come from Shanghai Fudan University, and my major is uh, comparative politics. Uh, my question is, uh, I found uh, that uh, all of your three uh, institutions, uh, it seems that you are all focused on uh, 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 Taiwanese literature, art, and uh, sociology. Uh, we know that in 1980s, uh, um, uh, cultural exchange uh, was a uh, foundation uh, for uh, improving cross street uh, relations uh, through uh, uh, movies and pop songs. Uh, people get to know each other and uh, feel closer to each other. So, do you think that this kind of scenario will happen again? In other, in other words, um, Taiwan studies in the United States now. Uh, are more uh, oriented to the world and to the United States uh, instead of facing the mainland at this stage. Is this uh, is there a shift of uh, Taiwan, Taiwan studies in the United States? Thank you. Well, I'll go. <laughs> Um, thank you for your question. And that actually is a, um, a very good question because um, Taiwan studies is um, also used to be very thriving in mainland China. Um, uh, but then in the past uh, years, uh, somehow uh, because of the, the tension between um, mainland China and Taiwan, and the United States. And um, so that kind of uh, very fruitful, productive exchange has um, stopped, I should say. Uh, so it's a pity, uh, but I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, uh, eventually things would open up. And um, I still feel that uh, building uh, institutional partnership with different um, uh, places in the world to promote Taiwan studies is important. And also Taiwan studies is not just about Taiwan, but also is about Taiwan in the world and its relations. And um, so at UCLA, our programming is, is uh, we try to be inclusive as well as uh, balanced. So we are not just focusing on the humanities or in my own field in sociology. Actually, we have a very strong component in uh, public policy as well as global health and education. And then Elizabeth just gave a, 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 an example about archeology span too and indigenous studies in the Pacific um, uh, region. So, so it, it was, um, to, to me and to us, it's very important for programs to be open, to be inclusive and, um, you know, to, to aim at knowledge production as well as, uh, relationship building. Did other people yeah, say something? I, I came to this country during the last Cold War <laughs> in the middle and the height of uh, the last Cold War. And that was in, uh, you know, that was a time people were you know, interested. I mean, that's why humanities is a little different <laughs> from the, you know, uh, public policy, political, international relations, and so on and so forth. I remember that, that at that time, people were very much interested in studying PRC literature. Okay? And then, so, uh, you know, I'm trying to say is that, you know, uh, uh, that's why if we focus on the long-term kind of intellectual exploration. And then, uh, you know, I don't think the, uh, at least in the field, in the area of humanity studies, I, I don't think that should be a, an obstacle. And also to add, 
that um, like we have um, in our program, uh, we have faculty who are really leading scholars in Sinophone studies. So Sinophone studies seems to be you know, lodge in the humanities or literature, comparative literature. Um, actually, uh, Sinophone studies is an example about, you know, how disciplines can be um, more inclusive and interdisciplinary, cross um, uh, disciplinary boundaries and things. And we have seen anthropologists uh, who, um, you know, connect through sino through the lens of sinophone studies for their research and outreaching. And in the Pacific Island and in Southeast Asia, um, you know, uh, it it also have people who are very interested in sinophone studies that has uh, relevance in uh, Taiwan, uh, in Southeast Asia, and um, other Chinese speaking. Uh, regions around the world. So, so Taiwan studies, we look at it as uh, very importantly as Taiwan in the world. So it's not just about Taiwan or on Taiwan, but, but, uh, you know, expanding it. Um, so, so it's, it's a, a very fruitful field. And I, I remember, um, uh, Richard and, and, and us had discussed about, you know, the questions about marginalization. And that is a way to, you know, to, to combat or to deal with marginalization of Taiwan studies to make Taiwan studies center and front in uh, intellectual uh, uh, research. And I have to agree, um, like Taiwan studies or even promoting Taiwan arts and culture, it's not really, although we frame it as like very Taiwan centric and everything like that, but it's really never about Taiwan itself. It's always about how Taiwan connects to the world, how Taiwan have dialogue with all the different things that's happening out there um, beyond the island itself. For example, um, I can bring some examples that is like some of the most successful public events we have in our past eight years are. Um, this concert of the small island based song. Although uh, we promote it as a Taiwan um, artist, but the artists are formed by all the different um, Pacific Islanders and Indians about how Taiwan connects, uh, indigenous culture connects to all the other indigenous cultures out there. And then we also have these um, wonderful film screening that also, again, we promote it as Taiwan co production, but then it was a co production with European countries and it, it touch on things that um, that is relevant to not only Taiwan but uh, about but um, so many different places. So, um, based on the events that we hosted and also um, the discussion that we are seeing in classrooms and a lot of academic programs, is that um, what interests people and also what we're trying to promote is always um, things that are already hybrid in its nature. So, Taiwan is just really a part of it and how it's made connection, making connection, and how it's placing itself in the world. So yeah, that is a question. Thank you for the question. Uh, we're just about out of time, but I would like to give our audience uh, the chance to have their question asked. So I'll ask the question and then each of us can give a uh, one sentence response uh, to it. And then we'll end discussion here. So our question comes from Sydney Yuan. The question is based on your experiences, do you think there can be more Taiwan studies programs in the United States? If so, what would be your advice for establishing a new Taiwan program in North American studies? And I'll start by saying, build allies and don't be afraid to uh, search marginalization, intersectionality topics that reach into communities such as minority serving institutions and also K through 12 outreach. That's I think a new area that Taiwan studies can really forge some new paths in. Uh, so why don't we start with Min and Elizabeth and then go to Ellen and Yvonne. My one sentence, I would say yes um, to the question. And then where there is a will and uh, there is a way and we just need to be persistent to convince uh, potential donors and uh, the administration uh, to, to, to get a program in place and then eventually institutionalize. Um, of course, um, I would um, advise um, to, 
to um, identify um, the stakeholders on your campus uh, who would be interested in Taiwan studies and, um, and then articulate the goals of such a program. Um, and then um, run on sentence. Um, I would also advise um, collaborating with the Taipei Economic and Cultural Offices um, because I think this has been apparent, there's a very um, strong outreach um, uh, on the part of the ministries um, of Taiwan um, to promote and develop overseas programs and they can provide seed funding and um, connections um, and they're, they're uh, a good resource now. Plan to take advantage of one sentences. So yes, absolutely. There's never enough. Um, and my advice would be really listen to um, the, the the people that will be embodying the program, like the students. As we we focus so much on the young students, they have their very particular, very inspiring, very interesting way of connecting with Taiwan through their hyperspace, the space that we have no idea how that happened. And then that's really a lot of inspiration to take on, and that really helps shape a very unique. Um, program for your campus and also for the public that's surrounding your campus. I would say that one thing that we have never mentioned but it's on everybody's mind is that we need to work very hard to get uh, new positions that are, you know, either focus on current studies or encourage right, in different ways, encourage like Thing that you know, such as <laughs> sign up on Taiwan, whatever. I think that's the most important. I think the fact that that the, the fact that the funding, you know, that we will get more funding. It, it's you know up to us to kind of steer the direction. You know, Korean studies. It, 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 you know, as many people said, the Korean foundation has done a great job in creating new faculty. I mean, compared to like twenty years ago, they had a lot more, a lot more. Uh, faculty, then, you know, uh, yeah, so we could do that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much to all our panelists for a great discussion. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, and have a good Sunday. I hope this discussion uh, provides some uh, feedback then on how to build Taiwan Studies Institutions. Uh,